Thank you very much, Peter. Actually, your parents can't take any consolation. I actually don't wear a tie because I have a serious neck condition. Um, typhobic syndrome, um, as it's called. So I just, just can't wear a tie. You have no excuse. Um, uh, I also uh, am nervous because of what you said leading up into your introduction um, about all the incredible work that people have put into the Geddes Trust, which I can see uh, uh, all around and in meeting the winners of the prize earlier. <clears throat> and then we say that the work has taken the 35 years, and I think, 35 years and you've ended up with me. Um, no pressure there then. Um, then. Then, just before I came on, I was asked my favourite question before a lecture, which is, are you using slides? Now, i tell you why I find that's one of my favourite questions. Uh, one of the things that I've been doing a lot, ever since in 2011, I had, was the, what did you call it, a victim or of, a, of a medical accident, uh, something went very, very badly wrong. I read about it afterwards. But one of the consequences of that was four days of delusions and hallucinations. Uh, and doctors are incredibly interested in patients who can talk about the things that they've got, particularly if doctors get to see them, don't quite understand them. They're really good like that. So I've been going round to a lot of places, a lot of intensive care places and anaesthetists and so on. It's interesting speaking to anaesthetists. Uh, you're never quite sure if they're awake. Um, <laughs> And um, talking about these four days of hallucination in hospitals, how about on the first night, it was three nights of it in four days, I thought the couple in the next bed were persecuting me. Now, think about that. There can't have been a couple in the next bed. That's not what happens. Next night, the night shift turned me into a zombie. Uh, the night after that, the night shift prepared me to be eaten by degenerate cannibals from Switzerland. I still got the memory of it very, very keener. And then, when I was about to give this talk for the first time, somebody asked me, do you have slides? <laughs> and I thought, what would you want me to have slides of? <laughs> Maybe I could do a hand picture of zombies, or uh, et cetera. So I am slideless in schools, uh, examination schools. Um, and it's also funny for me to be here because I was actually elected my first ever election I won, I won in this room, probably standing round about here, which was when this place was occupied by Oxford students in the uh, autumn of 1973. Um, some of you already nodding censoriously. Um, and I was elected to stand for the uh, Oxford University Student Union Executive on the occupation slate. Uh, it had one policy, which was to sit in stuff. Uh, and I got elected, actually. Unfortunately, I also got sent down the next term. <laughs> but that meant a quite a long uh, period in student politics ended up with me being president of the National Union of Students. Uh, and that means that I was six years older than Philip Geddes, uh, but I became a journalist only a year before him. So we would have been very roughly contemporaries coming into uh, the business. Uh, my first year, in December of 1982, as a researcher on Weekend World, I went to Northern Ireland uh, to uh, investigate the background to an Irish National Liberation Army bomb, bombing of army and other people at a place called the uh, drop-in well at a town called Ballykelly. Um, it's very hard now to explain, and I, I've tried with my own, my own children, and they kind of understand it, what it was like to be in the middle of the troubles, uh, to report them, to see the human consequences of them, um, to see what happened when that minor war erupted also on the British mainland. Um, so a year after I had reported that, and I was reporting other things, um, uh, the IRA put that bomb in that car, December the 17th, 1983, outside Harrods, Six people died, as you will be uh, recalling, and so on, three of them police officers. Um, and classically, the person that this fund is named after uh, was killed because he moved towards the story, because he wanted to tell people what was going on, but because that urge to tell people something is what ties all of us strange beasts together uh, for good or for ill. And so in that sense, it is, of course, an enormous honour to be here and to remember not just 
that life, but also in a sense my own earlier life and the earlier lives of, I think, a number of us here who lived through the same kind of uh, a period. Anyway, that's enough of uh, a, a preamble. Uh, on to the rest of the lecture, which I also have no slides for. Um, I was a part of a panel last week at King's College London, which was uh, there for a presentation by a chap called Bobby Duffy, who's now at King's College, was at the polling organisation Ipsos Mori. And what Bobby specialises in is misperception. Um, in other words, he looks at the difference between what people think is happening and what is actually happening, not just in Britain but elsewhere, and attempts to show what difference it makes and how to try and explain it. Um, so one of my favourite Bobby Duffy-isms is that in Britain, uh, we guess actually correctly that the average male aged 45 to 54, how many men here are aged 45 to 54, if you put your hands up for me? Is that all? Three? <laughs> Liars. Anyway, well, you three, on average, you've had 17 sexual partners, apparently. But women, so how many women here are aged between 45 and 54? More. And actually, this is a statistical problem which comes up here, but estimate that women must have had the same number, whereas the true figure is less than half of that. Now, there's always somebody at this point who says, well, actually, that's impossible. Actually, they must be equal. Um, and so on, but no, think about it, get somebody to explain it to you. There are some very useful statisticians around. It's not, it's not my job, but it has, doesn't have to be equal, and it's not. Um, but then, after we had the fun of that, comes some more serious um, uh, uh, revelations. And the one that really struck me in the context of this talk, which I'd already uh, uh, agreed to, to, to give, we'd agreed the title of, was the estimation of different groups of people about things like what was the biggest cause of violent death in the United States as asked by, uh, 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 as uh, put to Americans. Now, okay, let's have a shout out. What do you think the biggest cause of violent death in the United States is? <laughs> Absolutely. So I would then give me guns. 83% um, of Democrats said that the biggest cause of violent death in the US was guns. Democrats famously want to see, by and large, guns, some form of limitation to the ownership of guns in the United States. The percentage of Republicans who rightly said guns was the biggest cause of violent death was 27%. 27% were utterly wrong about the biggest cause of violent death in the United States. Now, of course, it was an audience at King's College London and so on, so we were all thinking kind of roughly the same thing. So somebody in the question and answer said to Bobby, said, are there similar sorts of things which go the other way where Democrats are as badly wrong on an issue as Republicans are on that? And he really had to work hard to find an example. He really did. It was very noticeable. In other words, by and large, if you were a Republican, the chances were you would get many more things wrong about how the world actually was than <laughs> Democrats would. Uh, in other words, your misperception of reality in society formed quite an important part of what you were politically. Um, and of course, being a bunch of liberals in that room, we were all highly satisfied with that. <laughs> But as you can tell from the uh, subject uh, heading of my speech, actually it's a hell of a problem. Um, it's a hell of a problem at the moment. Um, the Guardian published recently a, 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 an estimation that authoritarian populists have tripled their vote in Europe or European countries over the past 20 years, and that one in four Europeans voted for populist parties, almost all of those populist parties of the nationalist right, at their last election, and 12.5 million Europeans live in a country with at least one populist authoritarian cabinet member in 1998, but by last year, that had risen by tenfold to 170 million. 170 million Europeans now live with one of these people in their cabinet. It so happens that last week, um, 
uh, the former Prime Minister Tony Blair was giving one of his speeches in America. Um, and it was entitled, Reviving Moderation in an Era of Crisis and Extremism. And as ever with Tony Blair, um, everybody says, oh, not Tony Blair again. And as ever, if they read the speech, what they will discover is that it's full of the biggest lot of good sense that anybody seems to be speaking at the moment. Uh, but Iraq. Okay. I don't know. But Iraq. Um, not but the Good Friday Agreement, by the way. Um, but Iraq. Um, and he said in his speech, moderation had become like flared trousers and long playing records and so on, um, which are things which you can still believe that Tony Blair likes a lot, and he would wear flared trousers if he could, and he probably has all his long playing records and so on. But he noted that in Britain, centrist, he said, was a word now used as an insult, whereas once upon a time it was possible to say moderate or the word centrist and actually convey, if you like, almost an opposite prejudice, which was this was obvious, this was synonymous with being sensible and everybody else was not sensible. Now it's synonymous with being, well, what? I notice, uh, I don't know whether the rest of you do, the kind of strange political and personal journey of the Reverend Giles Fraser. Um, who, when I first knew him, was a man of what you might call the rough centre-left, progressive, progressive on issues such as homosexuality and family and so on, would have been horrified by dictators. You remember he resigned as the canon of St Paul's when they wanted to move the tents of the Occupy uh, 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 movement from outside St Paul's, etc who has very gradually, and I don't know whether it's the effect of a divorce and a very small child, and so on, and these things actually do sometimes happen. Um, well, there's nothing like small children to make you go through a brief feeling of communitarianism, really, and authoritarianism, because when you have small children, your first impulse is that everybody else is trying to kill them, um, uh, and that they need to be protected from everybody else, so that kind of, you know, and then after a while you get over that impulse, you get your second and third child, and you think, well, maybe they don't need quite so much protection that I need to become a fascist about it, uh, and so on, and uh, I've seen, I certainly remember this, uh, this progression myself. Um, so, but I, I only note it, not just because I want to get at Charles Fraser, and I really do, actually, I'm, you know. <laughs> man, man manages to go to Syria and meet with murderers and then tweet out about what a kind of wonderful lot they all were, etc. And I said, the, the grand mufti, whose hand was, who his shaken was barely kind of, you know, unblooded from signing death warrants, which is one of the things that he has to do. And so what a fabulous discussion he had. And look at this view out of the window. And he thought, yeah, probably the last person who, who dissed him got thrown out of that window. Um, but his movement is uh, away from the uh, kind of position, is accompanied by an absolute contempt for liberalism, uh, expressed contempt. Liberalism has destroyed family, has destroyed verities, destroyed communities, etc. Um, uh, and effectively, what has happened is what I would call a kind of Father Coughlinization of, uh, of the Reverend Fraser's politics. Now, of course, you know, it's not fair, he's not here good. Um, uh, and he would doubtless argue that I've got him all wrong. But I also noticed, for instance, in the magazine the New, the New Statesman, that the editor is massively in love with the philosopher John Gray, uh, most of whose philosophy is a kind of, you know, gloomy, nihilistic view that everything that liberalism has done is wrong, uh, and so on, without a very clear idea of what would might be in any way better. And I only mention them, but, and then of course there's the uh, far left view that anybody who isn't actually um, a neo-Trotskyist is a neoliberal. Um, uh, because no matter what are your other opinions, you essentially want the market to rule supreme over human beings. But this all comes down to much the same kind of proposition, which is that liberalism has, by encouraging or tolerating a diversity and a mobility has actually destroyed the fundamental basis of human collectivity and community uh, and so on and is therefore to be uh, resisted. Now that's a trend but it doesn't in itself uh, create uh, mean that liberals of whom I 
after having been a communist, I am now a relatively proud liberal, because in a funny kind of a way, I know what the other possibilities are. Uh, and I know how they think, and I know how they argue, uh, and so on, even if I was actually, when I was a communist, a very liberal communist. Um, again, that's something else that you're going to have to consult with other people about, like the thing about men and women and so on. It's like we haven't got time for it now. Uh, so the question is, uh, that I am partially raising here, is why have we been losing, which is what this question about the media battle is. Why have, if you like moderates, if you like liberals, whatever you, however you want to put it, um, that broad swathe of opinion which would go from almost from George W. Bush on the right over to Neil Kinnock on the left or even Michael Foote on the left, why has it been so badly losing. It's been losing in European countries, obviously lost in uh, the last American presidential election. Um, and one of, the, one of the explanations is that we don't know how to present our case in the modern world. In other words, it's the proposition that the other side or other sides have just been very much better and explaining to people or capturing people or in energising people or enthusing people with their vision of how a society should be, that's one, and just how crap liberals are, that's the other important part of their vision. Uh, on the other hand, because liberals have done X, Y and Z, which we've all been through. Um, I was very struck after the uh, 2016 referendum, the result of which was not a big surprise to me, uh, by the way, even if it was, well, I mean, this kind of myth that we were all totally astonished uh, uh, when uh, Brexit was voted for. Most of the people I know who, uh, who were kind of even Remainers who were thinking about it a lot, who thought about it a lot, thought it was extremely likely that they'd lose, uh, actually. But it becomes an important part of mythology to believe that they're so far kind of um, uh, removed from ordinary people's lives and, re and real lives that somehow or other no one see it, saw it coming. And I actually said to um, one of the organisers of the event as we were walking over that I discovered a piece I'd written in the Times in 2011 saying we're sleep arguing our way out of Europe and it always had worried me. Even so, even so, one of the explanations that was given uh, for the Brexit loss was given by the Leave EU's banker, Aaron Banks. Actually, if you're going to have a banker, Banks is a pretty good name for a banker. Uh, and it also rhymes. Um, <laughs> and he, in an, in an interview afterwards, said, and of course he was part of the Leave EU, i.e. the Farage campaign, not the mainstream campaign. We'll come to that in a minute. But he said essentially that they had won because Remain was all about fact. It was all about arguments and facts. And he said, and we were all about emotion. We plucked the strings of people's emotional response and they argued, Remain did. Not long after that, uh, after the Trump victory, Steve Bannon, who'd been one of the strategists uh, and architects of that victory, said that when it came to electoral politics now, the most powerful emotional tools in an election, an American election, were fear and anger. These were the things that you had to play upon. These were the things that would move people emotionally most substantially towards a particular position and a particular decision. Um, and that very much chimed in with a number of uh, arguments that I've been having which have been becoming increasingly frustrating for me uh, as a journalist, as a, an opinion journalist particularly, as an analytical journalist as well, over the course of the previous ten, at least 10 years. Um, you remember that we're not allowed to talk about immigration, but somehow or other we've spent the last 15 years doing nothing but. Uh, remember that. It's, it's kind of an, another one of these kind of tropes, which is, uh, which is false. But one of the things that you found yourself doing was whenever somebody like Migration Watch, the anti-migration watchdog, watchdog, well, what am I talking about, pressure group, um, issued one of its reports saying we're being overwhelmed with illegal immigrants and there's 100 million of them uh, and so on and we just happen to know this. Um, or that migrants are a drain on our economy or that they drive down wages or at a more local level outside of Migration Watch, which people can at our council is giving migrants free houses. And what you do is you take each assertion on 
in turn, because that's what you do. Somebody says, this is a fact, and it follows from this fact that this should be the policy or the attitude that should flow from it, and you play, it's not a fact. It's not actually true. It's the reverse of that. Here's the evidence. Here's the statistics. This is what it clearly shows. And then somebody turns around and say, why on earth are you bothering with that? Don't you know that they don't care that the issue is not the facts? You are giving them the facts, and actually what they want is the emotion. And you think, well, what am I supposed to do? What are we supposed to do here? Somebody comes in and says, I just saw you smashing up your neighbour's car, and you say, well, I've got actually a picture of me sitting in front of the telly for the last 10 minutes, let me show. And they say, don't bother me showing that, you're trying to confuse me with facts. It's emotion that counts with me, and I, you know, it's, it's my emotion that you did it. Um, it goes back to your kind of most basic schoolyard instinct. It's not fair. Why is nobody being fair to liberals anymore? Um, that's what I want to know, it's just not fair, which is a pathetic position to get yourself into. You feel it's pathetic even as you say it. But nevertheless, this is what you're supposed to, this is what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to meet the false fact with the understanding that actually the fact doesn't matter. Uh, today, we got a set of new immigration figures uh, out, um, and I saw them as analysed on Twitter, which can be a useful resource, by the way, if you use it wisely and block people and mute people who uh, you don't want to hear from. And there's a very good um, uh, political scientist up in Manchester called Rob Ford, and he was the first person who uh, I saw uh, talking about these figures and analysing them. Um, and the latest immigration figures, uh, if you've seen them, show that there's a big drop in net EU migration inward migration, and a big rise in net non-EU migration. So that's been going on in the background. So what has happened to people's attitudes, would we imagine, to immigration as a consequence? After all, it's always been suggested that it was the diff by, by people like David Goodhart and other people, it's, that it's the coming in of people less like us that causes the most emotional upset because it disrupts community. So you would anticipate, wouldn't you, that actually the salience of immigration had gone up as a consequence of that. It's gone down. So what Rolf Ford wrote is, in short, a big part of the electorate said two and a half years ago that migration control was their strongest motive for voting Brexit, but migration hasn't come down, isn't being controlled um, in the way that they want, quite the opposite, but they've mostly stopped caring about it and view immigrants more positively. Here's a conundrum, and this is what all this points to, I think, along with other public opinion evidence, is that views of immigration are more akin to a value than an attitude. That is, they are a long-term orientation related to deep-seated views about the world, not an assessment of current conditions. To which, the exasperated liberal says, well, stop couching it in terms of facts then. If it's not about the facts, will you just stop doing this? And we can stop arguing about it, and we can argue about your values and your attitudes and my values and my attitudes, and stop arguing about the facts if you're not interested in the facts. Hold. I am not prepared to cede that ground, by the way, just yet, and I think it's important that some people hold it. But actually, what's going on here is a continuation of a discussion that's been going on for quite a long time. Those of you who read Jonathan Haidt's The Righteous Mind, for instance, which was published about seven or eight years ago, it was an explanation to liberals of the internal value systems of conservatives and showing how there is a significant morality there. It's a morality which is not really um, uh, uh, open to simply being, cha to being changed by simply being uh, condemned uh, and so on, and that they had better understand what it is. Now, I have a certain number of problems with that, which is if we'd literally taken that attitude over the years, then it might have been extremely difficult to get the changes, the social changes we've got on the rights of uh, uh, minorities, uh, and actually, in the case of women, the rights of a majority. Um, but nevertheless, there is a point there which is that you are dealing, insofar as you're dealing with people's emotional responses, then in that case, in some kind of a way, you have to work out what counter-appeal you're going to offer and how you can do it. 
It gets worse than this, however, and this is where I come back to, the, uh, to, to Brexit, but also a certain extent to Trump. Because of the way in which we now absorb uh, our news and so on, and the way in which social media, the internet and so on, offer us a kind of al algorithmic uh, retrospasm in which our views get fed back to us um, and our prejudices are uh, compounded by the prejudices of other similars so that even with a, a species as given to confirmation bias as we are, all our confirmation biases are then confirmed um, and are not even seen as biases, uh, then in that case you have the capacity to have something which is very much worse. And actually sometimes, as in the case of what's been going on on Facebook, isn't even challengeable because you don't even know it's happening. Uh, the Facebook advertising, political advertising that was, that was happening, uh, and which was perfectly predictable, is targeted directly at the people themselves. So if you're not the people themselves, you don't see it, and you can't call it to account, you can't question it, and you can't even argue with it. Uh, for the most part, for large numbers of these things, we didn't even find out they were happening until much later, and then we found out that a percentage of them had actually originated through Russian intelligence and Russian um, uh, bots and so on. But that aside, what do you do when your very rebuttal of the thing that is being said to you that is wrong helps your opponent more than it helps you. How on earth do you get out of this conundrum? Um, uh, when essentially your opponent, who for our purposes we can imagine to be a lying, scheming populist, okay, <laughs> get that in your mind and so on, well it's emotion isn't it? So let's emotionally, are they going to emotionally dislike us for being namby pamby liberals destroying society, etc.? We can at the least return the favour by hating them back. Um, and so on. Uh, except, of course, look at us. When I said that, I can, a tiny moo of discomfort went through us because that's what we are. I mean, that, that's, that's partially our kind of problem. It reminds me of the story of the, a, a true story of the family whose mother was so saintly that she would speak well of anything. anybody ever, you know, Adolf Hitler's a terrible man. Oh, well, he has something to be said for him, sure, uh, and so on. And, they, uh, and for a bet, they tried to see, because she was a deeply religious woman, whether they could get her to defend the devil by dissing the devil, and sure enough, they could. Um, and in a way, you know, that's kind of part, that can be part of the problem of liberalism. But anyway, coming back to the kind of the judo throw, uh, of populism. Um, I was looking at what Dominic Cummings, the main organiser of the Leave campaign, um, you could argue the real genius behind quite a lot of it, was telling us in the months after the referendum about how it had been, uh, how it had been worked. And he put it down essentially to three major factors of argument. Control, the take back control was a very important one because it was a very simple uh, and straightforward uh, concept. But then he was talking about the things which had actually, but here he pointed out, he said, this referendum, which has had such incredible consequences for this country, such unbelievable consequences for this country, and still so many to come, was, could have been reversed if 600,000 people had voted the other way. It's a relatively small percentage. And in calculating which arguments might, be to get, might, might get that 600,000 out or stop that 600,000 from bothering to vote, which is a relatively small percentage, um, you are playing quite a micro game uh, sometimes. It could, have easily, it could easily, uh, uh, have happened the other way, he says. So, one of the things, he says, was a major factor was the take-back control. The second major factor was the NHS argument, because it was so simple and direct and so on. Um, uh, but the third one, he said, was immigration. Immigration was the third one. He said this. Um, the third element of the strategy was his vote leave to take back control of immigration policy. If we stay, this is how the argument that he was putting would go, there will be more new countries like Turkey joining and you won't get a vote. Cameron says he wants to pave the road from Turkey to here. That's dangerous. If we leave, we can have democratic control and a system like Australia's, it's safer 
to take back control. And then he says, that's the quote, and then he says, analyze now, I'm surprised at what a shock it was to remain when we hit them with Turkey. By the time this happened, they were in an almost impossible position. I wanted them to announce a veto, in other words, to say, well, actually, Britain would have, like any other of the countries of the 28, would have a veto over Turkish accession. It would not have been believed and would have had the opposite effect. People would have taken the danger of Turkey joining more seriously. If your life depended on winning for Remain, the answer is clear. They should have said long before the campaign started, as part of the renegotiation process, that they would veto any accession. Now, that last bit is just purely a factual error. You didn't have to say it as part of any renegotiation process. It was already true that such a veto could be operated. It already existed. There was no chance of a Turkish accession unless all existing 28 EU member countries agreed to it, and they weren't going to, and wasn't even remotely going to happen. But you see what Common Cummings therefore has said. One of our key planks was based on a complete fiction. It was a lie. He doesn't say the word lie, but it was a lie, which our leading people put out there. But if the other side picked it up, it would have the effect of making the lie even worse for them. And if you remember, Penny Mordaunt, who is now a senior minister, even denied a veto was possible. She didn't, not because she was lying, because she didn't even know. Because that's the other thing which is quite often a problem for liberals, is they expect other people to know the shit that they do. Um, and people don't. So, it was simply not true, they knew it, but your rebuttal helped see the story. Um, but consider, for instance, facts that the British public never knew. Do we think it would have changed them emotionally, for example, if instead of calculating, as most people do, that EU investment in Britain is 30% of the total, it's actually 48% in 2014 figures. 48%. Do we think it would have, I mean, some of you may have campaigned one way or the other. Would it have made a big difference to you if you'd said it's 48% rather than 30%? 48% is quite a lot. Um, the same people, which is all of us, reckon that Chinese and Japanese investment was around 30%. Actually, it's about 5%. In other words, it's nugatory. The sheer size of our involvement in the European Union is something which I think quite often fails to impress itself upon the British uh, population. But then, as I wrote when I looked at Duffy's work, this is a classic of what Duffy calls directional estimation. You make an assumption based on what chimes with your pre-existing belief. You down the EU side because that's not really what you want to hear. You up the other side because you want to think that there are other possibilities out there. Now, of course, it's not true to say that the recent period has all been a history of liberals or, or moderates losing, um, although it can feel like that. But you can see what problems it has, even if it's successful. So we look at Emmanuel Macron, a non-party young moderate, with a very, very complicated weave of policies and reforms for France, including some pretty radical ones which he believes will make France more dynamic and less chlorotic. The kind of reforms, incidentally, which other people have been urging upon French presidents for years because they feel that this is a kind of economic powerhouse which can be, which can be released. Um, and, of course, what it actually has released, uh, uh, or it did at the end of last year, was the Gilet Jaune movement. Now, this is a movement which is characterised, more than anything else, by emotion, by anger. Sometimes it's well-directed, but much more often it's almost inchoate, and it has a kind of physical force element, and it's incoherent. Um, and... By the beginning of this year, by, the, well, by Christmas of this year, people were saying that Macron was doomed. His, uh, his approval ratings had gone right way down. People in France were saying that they actually supported the Gilets Jaunes by orders of 75, 78% rather than him, although exactly what that meant was never really tested. Um, uh, uh, but nevertheless, he was in a huge amount of trouble. In other words, his kind of technocratic, what seemed to be a technocratic policy-driven approach, do these things and eventually we will get to this, was cut against 
by a, by a series of um, incredibly heartfelt, sudden, contradictory uh, grievances about modern France, almost all of which must have predated him by several decades. I mean, it's not as if he kind of brought these things in in 2017 and, uh, and so on, uh, and then presented as do all this, uh, do all this now. So, big problem. Losing everywhere, losing the argument, losing the emotional argument, unable to uh, appeal, incredibly vulnerable to being told uh, moderates and centrists or whatever it is they call it, they're useless and they're the problem and they've been undermining everybody and so on. So what do you do? Uh, in The Guardian, um, my uh, colleague Simon Jenkins, um, colleague columnist, um, was writing just after the election victory of Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil, who is a classic authoritarian right-wing populist. What he'll actually do in power, I don't know, but certainly in opposition, that's what he's been all the time, of a, you know, uh, a really repugnant variety. And Jenkins wrote, every continent is now seeing the emergence of mostly right-wing disruptors. They appeal to those who feel excluded by identity politics, because this is one of the, uh, the things, the left and liberals have encouraged identity politics by, I don't know, allowing Black Lives Matter people to wander around, etc., uh, by what they see as liberals pandering to minorities. They feed on religious intolerance and on neighbourhood insecurity. They spit anger at any form of establishment, yapping in their van. And I think what he means by this is the vanguard, not a kind of, you know, van uh, vehicle, are the jackals of social media spreading fear. Um, Incidentally, I, I love Simon. I do think that if you say the jackals of social media, it probably is because you don't use social media very much. There are a number of, uh, uh, there, there are a number of uh, expressions you can use about social media. I don't think jackals is quite it. Um, but anyway, you know, well, it's my podium. I can diss whoever I like, really. Um, <laughs> And then he wrote, in the light of the rise of the new right, it is not enough for liberals to stay silent. Lies and hatred cannot be pervaded across the globe for profit. Hysteria and anger cannot become standard political discourse. Regul the boring modalities of democracy, regulating elections, curbing censorship, taming extremism, fighting corruption, all matter crucially. <laughs> yeah, I agree with that. And then he stopped. That was it. So, how do you stop hysteria and anger becoming standard political discourse? We don't want it to. How do we make the boring modalities of democracy matter as crucially to other people as they do to us? Um, and how do we do it in media terms? Uh, how do we make the contrary appeal? How do we pull the thing back a bit? Um, how do we stop this dragging us further and further into the abyss of illiberalism? Because the one thing that I really am convinced of is if you don't like liberalism, you haven't seen what illiberalism can do. Um, well, one thing that you can do is Mark Rutte, the centre-right Prime Minister of the Netherlands, who managed not to be defeated by um, Geert Wilders uh, in the last Dutch election, says we should have good populism to fight bad populism. And what that essentially means, as far as I can tell from Rutter, is on some of the key questions which populists go on about, you co-opt their message. You just say, OK, we're going to do it, but we'll do it better. You, know, you don't like immigrants? We'll be more effective in not liking them for you by meaning that there are fewer of them and so on. Um, and it's, after all, this is actually a game say, Labour played with regard to immigration right the way through the 60s and 70s, so the first part of the 70s. So this is not a new thing uh, at all. And it was Mrs Thatcher who partially dealt with the incipient threat of the National Front by telling a TV interviewer that people felt swamped by people of a different colour. That's literally what she said. Um, and some people put down the de subsequent decline in National Front voting to the idea that somehow or other their grievances, grievance that other people were of a different colour, uh, which is quite a grievance really, um, uh, she felt it too. We feel what you feel. We are scared of what you're scared of. We're really with you. Um, so one possibility is to chase bad populism with a kind of variety of good populism. But one of the things that I do, I think I observe, 
is that right-wing populism, authoritarian populism, only really actually takes off at the point where centra, the centre-right gives it validity, actually validates it, actually says, yeah, you know, you've got a really good kind of point here. Because what then happens quite often, just as often as people saying, well, we'll have the old you know, centre-right because they're safer, is that people are just as likely to say, well, let's have the real thing then. You know, their record, the record of the anti-immigrants of the far right is far better, they're far more consistent. Uh, Marie, Le Pen is, uh, 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 Marie Le Pen is much more uh, a better record on it than, say, the Conservative uh, uh, challenger and so on, so we'll go with her. Actually, that has been what's happened uh, uh, in France. Um, what we could do, of course, is we could become as emotional as they are. Now, one of the things you'll notice in this speech is I've assumed that none of you are them. And I apologise if some of you are. No, I, I honestly I do. So if there are any members of the new Nigel Farage Brexit party, it's a perfectly valid thing for you to be. I'm a liberal. I believe in your right to do it, and I believe in the capacity to have argument. And uh, incidentally, it is actually uh, a slight liberal trait that we uh, have an incapacity to understand other people's emotions sometimes. That is true. So uh, we have to be careful. So I apologise for the assumption that I've made, which may not be true, that people by and large in this hall share my uh, prejudices and assumptions uh, and history. But, so when I talk about we, you can park yourself on the other side and know that you're not part of the we, but I think, um, uh, I think most of us understand what we're talking about here. So should we actually just become that emotional um, tempest that populists and populisms are? Should we replace their populism with an incredible uh, level of intolerance of other arguments and rhetorical certainty in everything that we say and do? Well, the answer is actually, through the Brexit process, some of us have started to behave like that. Um, uh, I've seen uh, pro-Remain campaigners who have got stuck into the BBC in every way as unreasonably and incontinently as any Lever ever managed to do. Uh, I've seen, watched it happening both on social media uh, and elsewhere. Um, the BBC has covered Brexit badly, they say. Yeah, there's, some, there's a case to be made for this, uh, certainly during the, uh, uh, during the campaign. Um, that must be deliberate. Somebody's doing it on purpose. Why? But nevertheless, this is how the mindset begins to go. This is actually the result of a decision to do bad things. In other words, we've got a scapegoat, and this is, becomes a scapegoating is an incredibly important part of an appeal to, of a populist appeal to emotional po politics. We're so fed up as a result, we want to stop paying the licence fee and we don't care if the BBC disappears. This is, I've actually seen this argument repeated in many cases and Lord Adonis has actually partially been responsible for this. Uh, a more moderate man uh, on the whole you'd think you wouldn't meet. This is madness. It's literal madness for, for people on the liberal side of politics to want the BBC to disappear, the place where you bring the nation together to talk to itself, uh, to, to each other, rather than disappear into its silos. To want that to disappear in the way it's disappeared in America is total craziness. And one of the things that I think the Liberals have got to be very care careful about is that, and something I've learned and changed my mind significantly about, is long-lasting institutions, though they are open to change and they're open to criticisms, have generally lasted long because they have real value. And if you destroy them, you won't easily build up other institutions which are as good as them to take their place. And incidentally, I think, now I think about it, and we come to this point, this has got to be one of our arguments. And that does argue, I suppose, to a kind of uh, a more emotionally conservative uh, uh, area. It's not to say that things shouldn't change and that things uh, aren't capable of, of, of radical reform, but that you should be incredibly careful about which institutions you end up destroying as a consequence of a desire for that change. So there are people who have taken up the cudgel in precisely the way some people suggest and said, yes, we will appeal to our emotions. It's interesting how pro-Remain people, the EU, didn't become emotional about it until we had already voted to come out. It would have been good if we'd been emotional about it 10 years ago, to be honest. 
Um, although slightly more kind of reasonable, but no, you know, there we were trying to point out how much of our uh, investment income actually was from the EU and nobody was listening to us. <clears throat> now, I don't mean by this, I don't want to uh, say this, I want to come to an end very shortly because I've probably been going on for about eight hours, um, that I am totally pessimistic. I mean, one of the things you have to say about populists is that when they get into power, none of their stuff works. Uh, it doesn't work because their solutions are simplistic. Um, they're based on unreal perceptions of how, uh, the, the, uh, of how things are. Um, if you want an illustration of it, which I think is sort of quite fun, um, the, one of the vice premiers of the Italian populist government is now the most popular uh, politician in Italy, Matteo Salvini of the Lega. Uh, former communist, once himself in his, uh, in his early days, um, and now having kind of is now circled round behind to come up on the far right. Now, Italy has a problem. If it's going to be genuinely anti-migrant, then it's going to die because it has a significant ageing problem and it has been nothing like at replacement rate. But anti-migrant is Salvini's position. What are you going to do? Come on, give me some ideas. Give me some ideas what you do in that situation. What does any good old fascist or indeed Stalinist do under a situation whereby your population isn't replacing replacement rate? What do you do? You tell people, women, to have more babies is what you do. And you invite them to, be, to feel better if they have more babies, to be better citizens because they have more babies, and you offer to pay them to have more babies. And that is literally what Matteo Salvini has been, has been suggesting. But, okay, let's just take a little test. Hands up, those of you who think that such a strategy will work, that people will have many more babies because Matteo Salvini thinks they should. Uh, let's, let's just have women here. Let's just have women here. How many women here think that lots of women will have more babies because Matteo Salvini says they should? Which one? And I don't believe you. <laughs> I think you're mischievous. You have that look. Um, it's not going to happen. It cannot work. Uh, part of the problem with the anti-migrant uh, movement is that actually, because of our demographics and so on, we are incredibly dependent upon uh, new migrants coming to our countries and have been for some time. Um, it may be a boring liberal fact, but it is actually something that also underpins economic performance and, cap uh, and capacity and also our future ability. Even, I mean, to take something very small and a small example, if we were significantly to cut down on all migration, we would have, and we're already going to have, an instant crisis in social care. Uh, it's a classic, it's an absolute classic example. You see it almost immediately and so on. So, their stuff doesn't work. That's just a little example, but it doesn't work anyway. They can't make the controls they do. Uh, they do. Their economic policies and autarkic policies, trying to kind of create separate economies, doesn't work. Now, one of two things happens under those circumstances broadly uh, when populist policies don't work. One is that they begin to do something slightly different. You know, some of them get it and understand it. If you think about um, uh, Alexis Tsipras of Syriza, a left populism in Greece, what gradually happens is they work out that they can't do all the stuff that they promised the electorate they do, so they, they kind of nudge towards doing other things bit by bit. That's quite a common pattern, and we can expect it in quite a lot of those uh, situations. But the other thing that you can do is that you can double down. In other words, you can say... Our great ideas were brilliant ideas, but the saboteurs, the traitors, have stopped us from doing them. And if we can only root out the traitors and the saboteurs and take control of X, Y, and Z, then in that case, we've got the problem licked. Classic examples of that, Venezuela suffering from almost exactly that, uh, that, those sets of syndromes uh, at the moment. And there are a number of other places you can think of where the same thing happens. Um, the other thing that has to be said is that for various reasons, um, not least younger people and new generations and so on, particularly in Anglophone countries, 
um, it's quite likely that the, that the particular form of the right-wing authoritarian spasm is quite likely to be short-lived. And for an example of that, we can see the uh, congressional elections in the states, which were a considerably greater defeat for Trump than I think people were prepared to admit. I mean, there is with Trump a kind of, you know, a kind of betting against yourself element because you didn't expect him in the first place. Everybody kind of feels that it's the right thing to do to sort of predict, oh, yeah, well, you know, I have a horrible feeling he's going to get back at the next... I mean, if, how many times have you heard this? Um, and you can completely understand why somebody would say it because it's bad enough that it would happen, but at least if it does happen, you're somebody who's predicted it. Um, and we all kind of get into that kind of situation, and I don't expect that, actually. I think, uh, in fact, the innate majority against Trump will actually uh, uh, motivate itself. So, where does that leave us? Now, I was having a conversation with my friend, the psychoanalyst, this morning. I have a friend who's a very famous psychoanalyst and so on, and I put problems to him. And I said, Steve, I said, I don't know what to say quite at the end of this because I don't really quite know the answer. And Steve said this. He said, I find it very useful under these circumstances to get to that point and then say... At this very interesting and speculative point, I think it's appropriate to turn it over to you, the audience, <laughs> for some opinions. And so I do. Thank you. <laughs>